Hi, Dane. Hey, Amanda. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Well, I'm glad you're here. And everyone who's joining us, welcome to Fast Track Coaching. We have been at this thing for about three years, and I'm going to introduce you to a very uh, special guest in just one second. But if you're new to the show, let me give you a little bit of context. Uh, we meet about once a week or so to have conversations with folks that I think are significant influencers, both within and outside the photo industry. And today is no exception. Now, take note, we, we only are together for about a half hour. And that means that we need to get the most done in a concise amount of time. And the point of this is not for you to solve the world's problems or get everything worked out in the next 30 minutes. The point is to maybe get a couple things that's going to continue to move you along in the journey you're on relative to what you're committed to. So I hope that today's a contribution to that. And I suspect it will be because Amanda Sosa Stone is a remarkable person and a new friend to me. But Amanda, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dane. Thanks for having me. Now, for folks that don't uh, know you, um, and maybe they're in a genre that isn't quite as tight to what you're in the middle of, um, you are a mover and a shaker. You've been involved in a lot of things for the last decade around photography. You have a degree in photography. You're uh, active in a lot of spaces, both as a, you know, you've been an art buyer, you're, you're a marketing genius, you, you position people remarkably well. And when John Keatley introduced me to you, uh, I was immediately uh, embarrassed that I didn't have a context for all that you were in the middle of. And uh, we had a chance to get to know each other on the phone and you were gracious enough to join us here. But give folks at home a, a bit of context for what got you to where you're at in your career. Uh, well, I started, I had a degree in photography and semester one I knew I did not want to be a photographer but I loved photography and I couldn't. Um, and I speak to colleges um, all the time and I always say to students, you can love photography, you don't have to be a photographer. And you kind of see little light bulbs go off and I'll come back and I'll have students emailing me all the time saying, okay, well, you know, I, I, I exactly what you said I connected to. And I did not understand, I didn't have anybody to say to me, you, you don't have to be a photographer. So I knew I loved photography. It was the, I love the production, but hitting that shutter would make me, you know, this is a film, you know, I learned under film. Sure. And I would hit the shutter, I would get all stressed out, but then the processing and the editing I love. So I couldn't understand at that age what I could do with that. And mm. so then um, a woman by the name of Elise Weisberg came to my school and she started talking and talking about all the different things she did. And I said, oh my gosh, that's what I want to be. I want to be a consultant. So I went and I met with her in New York and I you know, went to school in Florida and she said, well, you can't do what I do. You have to get experience. So she says, but you can come intern with me. So I went, I became her assistant, and then I got a job as an art buyer. So she trained me how to be her um, and, and learned. I learned so much from her. I mean, she really was one of the, like, the godmothers of uh, consulting, and she was a rep, and I learned everything from her, and she has a wonderful book out. You should definitely check it out. And um, then on top of that, then I went into the art buying world, and I learned from that. Um, after 9-11, I moved back home and I started working virtually. And it started opening my eyes up to the world outside of New York City, outside of Mecca. Hmm. And um, that there's more out there, that there's more uh, photographers. Being in Florida, there were so many talented photographers. Mm -hmm. And I would always say, because I worked virtually then for the, the ad agency, and they would say, well, gosh, you know, we need green grass for a Cool Whip. Can you go and um, find a photographer? I'd find them, you know, 20 photographers in Florida, 20 photographers in LA, and I'll say, okay, take your pick, and they would say, uh, they're just, and verbatim, these, this is crap, and I would say, well, why, I mean, like, I'm a good art buyer, they're good, and, and all of a sudden I started realizing it was that stigma, if you weren't in Mecca, you weren't in Mecca, right. and it was hard to break that, um, that stigma, and it's still hard to break that stigma, that stigma still exists today. Um, and so after Art Bind, I left and I started consulting and I started repping and I repped for one year. And I always say it was the worst year of my life, but it was also the most educational because it allowed me to get into the shoes of the photographers and go, okay, this is hard. Mm -hmm. and, and realize it was very humbling because I realized I was a nice art buyer. I did pick up the phone, but you know, um, for the other art buyers, it, you know, they're busy. They're they're doing lots of things. And I was a young art buyer, and I was hungry. I wanted to learn more, so I was picking up the phone. Mm -hmm. So there are still those art buyers out there, but then there's still the art buyers that are that are busy and working too much. So it really gave me a good insight for what the photographers go to go through on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So that's all of that knowledge from school to a lease to art buying to repping to my own consulting experience I take all that in every single day how can I make my clients better and I'm learning 
every single day still for my clients. Hmm. Wow. Well, so there's a lot in what you're saying, and I'm madly scribbling because I'm like, there every every comment you made. I talk is, a lot, Dane. So <laughs> I, I I welcome it honestly. I because I, I I I'm in the one of the you know the selfish little secret I have in this show is. Uh, you know, I, I say it so that other people can listen in. Really, it's just for me to have conversations with remarkable people, and and this is the, you're that you're that person. And to hear your story, uh, in many ways, it gives permission for people at home to go, okay, I have whatever story they have, whatever history they have, and where they're at currently, uh, they have a, perhaps a lot more options than they think they do moving forward. And it sounds like the day that. Um, you know, you were given permission to not necessarily be a photographer, even with photography training. In a sense, for some people, I know right now, this is a um, a catalytic moment for them, and the the possibility of wow, I could participate in this industry without having to play a singular role that they thought was their only possibility uh, is is budding. Like I can actually hear it in people's minds even now, and and I could also I also appreciate that as you tell your story. It's not, it'd be tempting, I'm, I'm guessing, for people to hear that and go, okay, so clicking the shutter is really hard work. Uh, and so I will go to some other magical place, this fantasy land, where the, yeah. the work is easier. And what I really appreciate about what you're saying is like, no, 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 it's all hard work. At, whether you're the photographer, whether you're the rep, whether you're an art buyer, uh, in every context, we happen to work in a very challenging industry. And everywhere in the ecosystem, it's, it, if you don't work your tail off, you're not. You're gonna have a hard time. Um, and Weisberg said that to me on day one. She's like, "You can't be me. You have to get experience. Like, I'll I'll train you, mm -hmm. but you can't just be, I've trained you and go be a consultant. I literally had to go in the trenches and be the art buyer. And you know, whether even from buying stock to actually producing a job to negotiating. I mean, all those little things just become you know little you know vehicles to allow me to understand what my art director was working in because hmm. I was working with a suit on one end of the account executive and then I was working with a guy with a backwards hat ripped jeans and a skateboard coming in and I had to balance both of those worlds I mean that was all educational but it was not easy hmm. well okay so there's a number of pieces here so one is you know these sets of skills that you've acquired over the years around um, and by the way, it's ridiculous that you have as much experience that you have and you're as young as you are. Because I, I know there are people cussing at home, just so, just so you know, people are right now. I, I graduated and I was in New York City by 19. Huh. And I am now 33. So uh -huh. I can say, you know, I, I feel I feel good. So I am young. I feel excited to be able to have had the knowledge that I had and, and had the people in my life that I've been able to, that, that they've led me up to this date. So I've been very fortunate. Well, you, I get, you, you know, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but you have a um, a, a very, very winsome, um, I want to say attitude, but that's not quite right. But there, there's a presence about you that's very inviting, and people, I'm guessing, a lot of folks in, initiate with you just because you're so, you know, I, I, I want to hang out with Amanda. It's, it's like <laughs> a, it'd be a fun conversation. Um, how do you how do you hold that against intention around people taking advantage, or you know, I'm sure you have a lot of talkers who want to get your time. Um, how do you maintain a positive, constructive attitude in the midst of uh, some folks who are pretty desperate and are willing to do whatever it takes to get in front of you? It's a great question. Um, boundaries are definitely always uh, uh, an issue. I I'm I'm not a good boundary setter. I'll tell you what, because mm. if I ask somebody, I'll keep talking and talking and and. I and you know, and I schedule my day. I mean, I I'm very very blessed to say that I have a packed schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, I hate telling people I'm not available until, but you know, it, it is a blessing. It's a huge blessing. But sometimes I'm bad on my schedule. I can run late because I want to talk. Mm -hmm. I love this. If mm -hmm. I could have this all day long, I love this. And I'll tell you what, this right now, what we're having, you and I, Dane. You know, it's it's the. Um, this is what I want and with mm. anybody and I tell my photographers you need to have this with your clients and mm. and it's really hard I mean I'm poor I'm gonna just say this out there right now and I'm putting this out in the universe but I'm bad at email emails mm. are it, I'm notorious I don't enjoy emails there's you know lack of communication lack of connection I'm a horrible not typer but like just being able to communicate what's in this crazy head of mine mm -hmm to a little square box that's going to communicate everything. Mm -hmm. so what I said, sometimes you sound like a German woman. Yes, do this. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you have to have this human communication. I mean, uh, I love blog posting because I get to just write, write, write. But at the same time, I want this. And so sometimes I'll skip blog postings because I have more calls. And mm -hmm. um, I always tell people have a 
heartbeat before you actually have a social pulse hmm. on the social networking because you have to be social with a heartbeat before you can do that. So um, back to your question, I mean, how hmm. do you do this? I mean, it's hard. I mean, it's because I work one on one every day with people, and it's emotional. You know, I ride the emotional roller coaster with my clients because I don't have all the clients that they come to me usually when they're here. Mm-hmm. And to get here and it is emotional and I, I some days I do when I have a client and they're having a hard moment and they've come to me and and we're like writing out we just got the portfolios done and, and it's it's a financial drain there's I mean so many elements I do get emotionally like connected with my clients sometimes too much mm-hmm. and I have to step back and go what's my focus what's my intention and I have to keep you know sometimes I even write myself notes mm-hmm. of what I <laughs> hold those up again because people need oh, to see yeah. this. No, are you kidding me? This is gold. Are you? This is great. <laughs> okay. Okay. So have fun. Breathe. Work nine to five. Say no. Be compassionate. Self first. Incline second. Smile. Stop. Enjoy. Make art. Listen. Speak out. Reframe. Stay positive. Focus. You know, I'm actually hearing focus a couple more times. Uh, like, like there's there's concentric circles. Set goals. Finish it. Oh, set um, goals. Finish it. That that's actually from my uh, Andrea Mario, who's one of our latest consultants. She's like. I read this a long time ago, and I did. I said I'm writing this down in my feet. So. <laughs> okay, so what? Okay, so you're human, which is very helpful to know, and you Seriously. care, which is very helpful to know. Um, you know, you mentioned Elise Weisberg earlier, and, and the role that she played in your life. Uh, now that that you're in that kind of a role, do you have a, an Anna in your life that that, or do you have a series of people that come through and have a chance to to cut their own teeth uh, with with some direction from you? Um, I've had assistants, uh, uh, interns in the past. It's it's very hard. It's very um, it's mm-hmm. time consuming because you actually have to give extra three hours to your day if you have somebody come into into your life. Mm-hmm. I do welcome uh, students sometimes, if depending on my schedule. Right now, I have a nine month old baby, so there's mm-hmm. definitely no other babies coming <laughs> into my life right now. <laughs> Um, but it, it just depends and you know I've had interns that have come in and changed my world hmm. um, and I remember Elise used to say that I didn't really understand that and one time she had an intern after me that was much hipper and cooler and she'd come in with scarves and looked all cool so I definitely could you know see that impact so I, I do welcome I'm always learning every single day I learn from the people I work with the, from the clients I work with I mean I'm constantly like absorbing I feel like a constant sponge hmm. Okay, so let, let's switch gears a little bit and talk yeah. about talk about the photographer's perspective for a second. So there are folks that are, are trying to make, like one person that I don't know if you, do you know David E. Jackson? Have you met David before? No. Okay, so he's someone I'd like you to meet, but uh, he's a commercial photographer. He's in Wisconsin. He's exactly. amazing. Uh, and uh, he was actually on the show. I'll send you the link later. Okay. Um, but he's done some great stuff and um, he knows who you are. And <laughs> he... Uh, he and I were talking about his world, and what I what I love about David is he represents a lot of folks out there who they've kind of gotten over themselves a little bit. They've gotten past the point of being, you know, um, unconsciously incompetent. Now they're consciously either incompetent or beginning to kind of turn the corner and and realize like, okay, they really have some skill here, but they're not. They don't have hubris about it, and they are they they've hunkered down, they're head down working, and mm-hmm. they're clear on their focus. And this it's not sexy anymore just to be a photographer uh, that's that's going to be a future day for them and if that kind of a and you know the type I'm talking about like they, they're serious and they've turned a corner and they have a chance to meet you what what process do you take them through in broad strokes well it depends on where where they're at and what they need I have some clients that come in and they literally say Amanda I mean I'm kind of a structured girl so I have like a package of two hour or the whole sure. year and by the way, can interrupt for one second. If, if you guys are curious and, and it's helpful, go to sosastone.com or uh, Agency Access, I guess, is another space to consider. Your blog I love, the lab I love, all of it. But sosastone.com is probably the place to start. But keep going. So, you know, and, and I say to clients, you know, what is it? What's in your budget? What's, you know, and what's, what's your timeline? What, how available are you? I've had some clients that are just amazing and they just need a two hour from me and we get things just just more focused, we get them right on track and yeah. you know, the two hours like the presentation call and then the marketing call but I've had some clients that come right on board and they don't need the presentation call, they look so buttoned up that mm. they just need the marketing call and then we use that second hour to kind of regroup to see where they're at. I try to take each person, I try to have a structure so I know what I can do with them but then once I get on the phone with them, you know, it all hell breaks loose. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to get mm. so I try to really kind of fine tune and say, okay, this is our time together, let's use it wisely. So I never know what I'm going to get. When you know, I try to research the client. I try to have them tell me 
where they were, where mm-hmm. they are now, where they want to go. So I'm focused. But I could get on the call, and they've got it. They've got themselves so focused, and like you said, uh, centered that it, we just need to do minor tweaking. And it's little things like you know, I'll go down my marketing list with them, and I have this spectrum of marketing. I'll say, okay, what are you doing here? Okay, let's fill in the blanks, and they might be missing two ma- massive you know elements to their mm-hmm. marketing, and then it's you know all said and done, and they're good. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I wish that I I I'm not here. Um, I mean, we all work. We all want to make money. We all want to pay our bills. I want, I want to put braces on my kids. But uh-huh. at the end of the day, I want to see people successful. I mean, I always say to photographers, I want you to do what feeds your soul and puts you know money in your pocket. And again, I want the same thing. What feeds my soul is when a photographer calls me and says, I had it like today, right before our video. I had a killer meeting today. It was awesome. I, you know, That's what I want to hear. I want to hear about the killer meetings. I want to hear about the the bid request. I want to hear about the jobs. I mean, I love any of that. That's what feeds my soul. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me set one more context around someone who's coming to you. And I and I love what you're describing, uh, the, the idea of, of both compensation and like the anti-starving artist where actually someone's fulfilled okay. and actually can, you know, pay the, keep the lights on. Um, let's say, so, how, let's say someone shows up and they have, they've saved their pennies and they have an ability to get into a, a, a relationship with you. Um, and and they need help. Uh, they they're they're really uh, they have more ambition than they have talent, and they are um, they're willing to do the work. Though, what what could you do for them over the course of like say a year or two? I mean, those are the hard hard conversations to have when someone says, you know, I want this, and the work's not there. You have to have that honest coming. To, I call it the coming to Jesus moment <laughs> uh, for the Christians and non Christian people. Sure. But I think that. Um, not religious anyways, but I call well, it, it, it It's a very dynamic phrase because <laughs> the word Jesus can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. I don't want to go to that point. So, <laughs> um, so but anyways, it's that moment where he's like, it, it's not there. I've had calls where I had to tell a client, you know, I don't want to be that person to say you can't have your dream because I'll tell you what, I've had people that have come to me, they wanted it, I trained them, and I'll tell you what, they're making money. And mm-hmm. so I don't go to the... I, you know, I know there's people out there that'll say, "Yeah, they have it. You don't know. pick another career." Right. It's not me. It's not in me because I always feel like if you want it bad enough, you can learn it. I mean, you, so I've I've gone through that with clients. So I'm not usually the person to say you're no good. Mm-hmm. I say the work's not there. You might have two images out of a thousand that you sent me that are viable. Mm-hmm. So you need to go shoot. I will have that honest conversation, but. It's hard for me to tell somebody it's not possible because I was raised by a woman who said, whatever you want, you can obtain as long as you set it out there. And I always say, be careful what you wish for. So mm-hmm. I don't tell clients they can't. I just tell them the reality of what it will take. And it's really hard for clients that even the clients that are good to see. And I kind of see it like here. It's like this horizon I see ahead of me. Mm-hmm. And you're here with, and I can pinpoint it. It's like I always do like the timeline where I can pinpoint people you are good. It takes a year to even like launch out of the gate, okay? Mm-hmm. Hardcore launch out of the gate where your book's in order, your website's in order, maybe you had to shoot. I mean, that's a, it's a hard year. Mm-hmm. Then you launch and I can pinpoint from the date of you marketing to the date of you being on that plateau looking back at me going, hey Amanda, I'm here, I arrived, it's awesome. It's a three-year journey mm-hmm. usually. Like, uh, historically, I can pinpoint it to a three-year mark. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the five-year itch that makes me laugh when people are like, "I'm here. I'm kind of bored. I'm like getting itchy. I, I want, you know, I want to get out." That's the five-year point, and I crack up because it's so historically it's there. Mm-hmm. So I have clients coming to me from all those different levels, but it's three years is that horizon point where you've got to stay focused towards that. And photographers don't have the they do not have the patience mm-hmm. to wait out that three-year point, and that's. The hardest thing to try to ask somebody hmm. to say spend five thousand dollars up front. I'm not just I'm not talking about my prices, but on your portfolio, your sure. web, all of these things. Um, and no one hold me hard to that five thousand number. I'm just sure. throwing it over. Um, but you know, you spend all this money and you want immediate results. It's not coming that quickly, and hmm. that's such a hard pill to swallow. And I hate having to be the bearer of those news, but I I have to tell that I have to let my clients know realistically this is going to be a journey and it doesn't start it starts today but the results are the the ROI is long term Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's interesting I this morning I was reflecting on just business in general and how much uh, patience uh, is a 
even when I prescribe, like I prescribe myself, oh, be, pa be patient or whatever, really what I'm thinking is like six months of patience or nine months of patience. And oftentimes when I think nine, I probably need to multiply it by five mm -hmm. to be more close to reality. Uh, but you're right, it's a hard, it's a hard pill to swallow. And it, it really reflects a character trait. Like, am I, am I patient enough or the person that you're speaking with patient enough? What other character traits strike you as important uh, for resilience or kind of an ability to make it long haul, especially as you look to clients that maybe when you first met them, you're like, oh, I don't know if this one's going to yeah. this one's going to make it. And they surprised you or ones that they came in showing like they had all the right signals, but it took them the three years too. what are any character traits come to mind that you go, if these things are in place, they have a better shot. I don't know how much are their character traits, but I'll go try to go through my list of like what I think. Or characteristics, or yeah, I mean, I think number one, I mean, it sounds so silly, but you've got to you've got to be nice. I mean, that mm. sounds ridiculous, but you've got to be nice. And and I've encountered not so some not not so nice people. I mean, it sounds you know, it's the truth. Yeah. But you have to be nice. When I get somebody you know nice on the phone, the second we got on the phone, Dane, we were like, doo, doo, you know, we, we I don't think we could stop talking. Right, right, right. You enjoy that. So nice. You have to be. I mean. Think outside the box. I don't want to say that you know, cliche creative, but think outside the box. Know if a client comes to you and they have a specific need, like how can you service them? Hmm. And that's the the number one thing I always tell to my photographers is like, you're a photographer, you have a camera in your hand, you can service almost anybody if you can find a need. And photographers never see themselves as that salesperson, but you hmm. have to know how to sell that. I mean, I had I have a brother in law who literally at a garage sale walked out with a TV. He had five TVs out on the on the you know, lawn and he walks out with a TV and it never hit the ground. He's a real estate agent and he goes, I always know everybody has a need for something. They just don't know it. And if I can find it, the lady literally went like from hand to hand and he she had five TVs at home and he somehow told her she had the need for it. And he walked away walked away with it. And it's the same thing with photography. Every business has a need for some type of photography. Hmm. Even if you're small corporate. You know, I have a friend who has a roofing business and they just did an entire employee on seamless, you know, group, you know, employee shot and that's on their homepage. There's a need. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, what are those needs that you can service? I mean, it's between the shingles for a still life or an architectural shot to mm -hmm. the interior portrait, you know, studio shot. Like what can you service to this client? And I don't think photographers can sometimes think outside that box to see what a client could, you know, how they could use them. It's funny, I, I'm tempted to ask, the question I want to get to, and maybe we'll get back to it, is kind of where is the, where do you see as the biggest blind spot traditionally with folks that you've seen? And maybe that's not fair because everyone's unique. But the, as you said that, what struck me is, um, you know, these traditional categories or genres that photographers have fallen in, at least, you know, up until the last decade or so, uh, they seem to be very helpful. And yet increasingly, as I'm in conversations with photographers, I'm hearing them say that they, they have this tension to both feel the need for a specialty where they're known for something. And yet at the same time, that, that category that they're known in seems um, remarkably um, unique, not generic at all, that it has this kind of, um, I don't know, customization to it. It, it, it as as newer photographers are getting into the industry, uh, do you think that those old categories, the residue of kind of a bygone day, is, is that a, an hindrance, or is it just that, or is there another way to frame what I'm describing? Um, uh, what I, I I see it change with the industry. So um, more when you're when I would say even maybe say a decade ago there was a niche like you had to be in the niche you had to be known for this I mean the generalist and the generalist there's always a place for generalist and I don't think generalist is a dirty word at all mm -hmm. um, I have many successful clients who's a generalist but mm -hmm. you know it was that kind of like that niche and then the economy crashed and everybody started throwing everything in plus the you know kitchen sink and mm -hmm. people are going back to becoming a consumer photographer and all that and you know so I, I saw that huge you know change where people were doing both commercial and consumer because I kind of see it as those two umbrellas mm -hmm. and um, that that was a huge changing point I think in our industry where a lot of photographers were not a, were not ashamed to say I do weddings or I do you know corporate or family portraiture um, then then I am seeing a swing back trend where it's going back to niche hmm. um, where people are making it again with a style um, the, the one thing I, I guess I can say is that the one trend that I've always seen consistent when I was at the agency world to today mm -hmm. 
people are having the best careers of their life and people are having the worst careers of their life. It doesn't matter the economy. Mm. I really have seen that same answer from my clients um, regardless of the year, regardless of mm. the decade. I've heard it good and bad in the same day. I had that same conversation. Mm. So the, the formula I always see in that, that blind spot is is uh, the marketing element and mm. that you have to keep yourself out there. It doesn't matter what economy we're in, you can find a need with mm. your photography. Yeah, it's funny you say that. I mean, it, I know just candidly for myself, when I reflect, you know, if I'm having an existential moment with a glass of wine on a Friday night and I'm thinking about the future of the industry, I'm, I, I, I honestly have moments where I'm like, gosh, if it, with the proliferation of just camera, you know, photo takers, mm -hmm. um, not just on the consumer end, but just across the board, you know, the way that stock has impacted uh, commercial work and uh, all the stuff that's been out there, um, it can be tempting to say, really, is there, is there an industry for professional <laughs> photographers? And clearly there is. Um, but even long haul, is there? And at the same time, I'm struck with this tension of, you know, visual imagery and narrative storytelling through, you know, what you can see, not just read or hear. Um, it seems like there's never been a higher need than right now. Like everything seems so image driven. Yeah. Uh, so talk a little bit about, um, as you've been kind of watching trends and everyone says it's a hard market and it's increasingly competitive, but what else would you add to that conversation around the future of, of photography? I, I wish I knew if I had that crystal yeah. ball, I wish yeah. I knew because I, I'll tell you, I've even made predictions that I thought, I thought in the economy, I thought, um, uh, Food photographers were going to survive. Hmm. I knew architectural photographers were going to end up suffering, but I really thought my food photographers were going to make it hmm. um, because I felt like, you know, and Suzanne Cease and I used to, and that's another consultant you should definitely interview or, mm -hmm. or talk to. But um, we, we used to talk about then, like, okay, they're going to be doing recipes and, you know, because people are going to be cooking at home more and grocery shopping more, not going out to eat. And my food shooters suffered, and mm. I, I'm shocked. So, you know, you can make predictions all you want, but sure. until we're there, we don't know. I really try to tell people to be um, in the present moment. Yeah. So I'm skirting the answer. I just think it's really hard to know because, you know, I don't see it going anywhere. I don't mm. see print going anywhere. I, I love my magazine still. I mean, do I read a book on my, I you know, I touch? Of course I do at night because mm. um, it's easier and I can fall asleep with it, you know? Yeah, sure. But at the same time, I don't see print going anywhere, and so and the you know digital ads. I mean, I was just on um, uh, an online website the other day, and I saw this beautiful food ad, and it was just like, wow, that's beautiful. But it was digital, so mm -hmm. it's not going anywhere. There's a need for it, and you know, stock is still going to exist. I don't think it's a, another dirty word. I I actually like stock. I think I have a lot of photographers that still survive on stock, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and everybody having. Um, I'm getting a, a reminder that we're talking, Dane. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, I think that, um, you know, there is a need and, you you know, going back, you have to tap into it. But you also, the number one thing is instead of focusing on what the, the industry is going to be in the future, you've got to be present now. You really have to be focused on what do you need and what can you service right now? What are your skills? I mean, everybody's talking about motion. It seems like so yesterday. But guess what? It's still happening. Mm -hmm. And so many photographers aren't doing motion. And, and the local, more generalized markets really want you to be able to do motion. Even the larger agencies want for smaller jobs, want their photographer to be able to do motion. Of course, for the bigger jobs, they're still going to go to a traditional DP, but they are searching. They're, they're seeking that out. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it's, you know, I've had some really great, talented photographers that are taking DP jobs for big jobs because they want the vision mm -hmm. of that print to translate into into the motion. Totally. And sometimes right. it's very hard to do the backwards end um, of getting that feel from the the commercial to the print. So I see it moving positively in our direction, but you know, I'm not saying go and do motion. I'm just saying know what the market is offering right now mm -hmm. and be where you are right now and capitalize on what you can service right now. And I think mm -hmm. so many photographers don't capitalize on what they have right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really love how you frame that, the, the idea of staying in current reality with kind of a, a, a sensitivity to trends, but not locked into it because it's so unpredictable. And it's funny, just uh, just yesterday, um, uh, a, a 
a writer, Seth Godin, uh, did a little Kickstarter. Did you see his little Kickstarter thing he did? Yeah, I did but okay, I so so he did this Kickstarter. Like every, everybody's saying publishing is dead and you know Borders is closing and you know why write a book and everyone's writing an ebook, blah blah. Well, he did this Kickstarter campaign and granted he's Seth Godin. He's got a lot of followers, um, but he did a campaign where he's like, I'm I'm going to write this book and I want to create a new model for how to publish a book. And his goal was to raise forty thousand dollars in thirty days. And um, in, in, I believe, about a day and a day and a couple hours, he's currently at about 200 grand. And it's just this remarkable phenomenon. And, he, you know, he raised, his, he raised uh, the first 40,000 in like three hours or something. And his point is, if, if it's about risk, and his point is, gosh, if the author, and I'm going to make a translation to photography in a second, if the author can prove to the publisher and prove to the bookseller that, we're gonna we're gonna prove that my platform um, can bear the risk of if, if you go with me, you're, this is gonna deliver for mm -hmm. you. And you know, clearly with his platform, he's proven he has you know 15 bestsellers already. Great uh, great rapport. All the character traits that you described around even just his niceness. Uh, it, it's remarkable to me how much that translates. But his his whole thing is, man, if you're not patiently building an opt-in audience of people who like you, who want you in their life, have given you permission, forget about it. And I'm wondering, kind of his, his novel approach to what he's doing, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of watching this, this Kickstarter thing very closely just to learn, like what, not to copy it, but to go, what has he done that mm -hmm. could translate into our world and photography around building new platforms of becoming known and uh, having people, in a sense, opt in or give permission for an art buyer or a director or, or for you to even be to care enough to uh, for you to opt in into their lives uh, can you comment a little bit about what you think about that that idea of of um what is my idea i'm just excited about seth godin knowing you <laughs> 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 um this this notion that even in areas where people are saying that area is dead mm -hmm. whether it be print or whether it be whatever that that there are future models that haven't been invented yet mm -hmm. on becoming known and that there's that that I guess I'm making a statement more than I'm asking a question. Do you agree with what I'm saying? Is this no, a I possibility? Know, it, it's so funny that you bring this up and I'm going to sidetrack and follow with you. Um, yet just yesterday I was having an anal analogy to myself. I was uh -huh. talking, you know, I do that often. Me too. <laughs> um, but about the publishing industry and I have several friends who've self-published mm -hmm. and who've made great success. They're having book release parties and it's been huge for them mm -hmm. um, to the, the high, you know, the booksellers, you know, the Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, yeah, year. right, right. But, you know, and, and again, and my, my sister and I, we were talking about that and where it may not be the most, you know, eloquently, you know, written, you know, book, it, it's off the chart selling. Yeah. And so it's, it's, there's always a need. There's always a niche. And so there, it's just like with the photography industry. You're going to have your best sellers that are the New York Times bestsellers. And then you're going to have people that maybe are selling to more of a niche market, but there's still readership. Right. And then you have like the self publishers and then there's a smaller group. And so there's there's all these little pockets, and it's very similar to the publishing agency. Everybody wants to be that New York Times bestseller, but right. there's only there's a very small group that make that list, and that's okay. Like you, not everybody. There's not even enough jobs for like that market. Mm -hmm. And so as you can see, these pockets realistically look at what are your dreams. If you want to be this New York Times bestseller, you better start working your tushy off, you yeah. know, and, or have such a great idea and get it in front of the right person so that they can pass it on because there is. So many talented, you know, writers that have, you know, that wrote a book, but it's not getting in front of the right people. It's mm -hmm. just, it's not that the talent's not there. It's just how you get in front of the right people. So it's the exact same analogy. And so I do think that there are those niches. And I do think that, um, you know, it's just a matter of how you actually get in the door and actually, you know, sometimes you could be a self-published book. It's read by the right person and then it, it takes to the next level. Totally. That's what photography, it's the same thing. Regardless if you're a consumer photographer and you have that great baby picture in your friend's house mm -hmm. and then somebody sees it that wants to hire you and then it trickles down mm -hmm. to the ad shooter who is seen in Archive Magazine for an award and then everybody wants to work with them. It, it's the same thing. It just translates differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the... the, the uh, <laughs> I do enjoy talking with you, my friend. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I fall off on tangents. <laughs> no, you not at all. If anything, I, I always want to be sensitive to your time because I know you're very busy. And and selfishly, again, I just I, I, I want to have you back on the show. I want and just personally, I just really really appreciate your perspective and 
it, well, you know, one thing that's very common about both you and Seth and uh, uh, and Seth says this all the time is this notion of if you have a really great work that you want to make sure gets marketed three weeks from now, well, if you really cared about that work, you would have started marketing that two years ago for that to release in three weeks. And and he even says like if you have the best book ever written and it's coming out in three weeks, I have nothing to tell you. And and that's he's you know he's supposed to be the best online marketer in the world. And and I I, I guess what I'm hearing you say over and over and over again is. A level of commitment to to marketing, to getting your name out, to getting your work out, to getting in front of people, they're real you really have to have a long committed view to that end. Does that sound am I getting you? No, you, you have to. You have to have that I mean, I love I mean if you have a book coming out in three weeks that you had to have started, you know, two years ago and that's that same timeline. Like you have this vision and it's that three year point that I can pin you. I mean, mm-hmm. it really is the truth and you know, I have young people that come in and they're hungry, they're hungry, and I think they're a little bit more patient. And then I have the maybe the forty or the fifty year olds that maybe have been on the plateau, fell off and they want back, back up on, there right. quickly. And that's hard. I mean yeah. that's a really hard conversation to say, Well guess what? You know, that was a lot it, it was a it was a fun hike to the top, but it was a hard fall and we gotta get back going that way. And mm-hmm. it, that that's they're probably the hardest mm-hmm. is to get somebody back up that was popular in the 90s or even the 80s and even early 2000s I mean there was like little moments and you know I see a cycle it's it's it, it is a habit of photographers when they become so busy that they they you know right. get they get so busy right. that they fall off I actually had a client who said well I'm just a re- really busy right now I think I'm going to pull back on a marketing card I go did you just hear yourself say that he goes yeah I did oh my gosh I, right. I'm one of them now and it's those are the red flags you have to you have to listen for so mm-hmm. you know going back to the question of like can you see it yeah I mean you have to constantly be projecting um, even though I'm saying be in the present moment be in the present moment to know like I still have to market for tomorrow yeah. and the photographers who are marketing for success for three years from now the photographers who are at that three-year point still have to keep that wave and it's a wave and I mean even when I go off on maternity leave I feel a wave of my lack of marketing because I'm, I'm in la la land for a moment and I yeah. feel it and so I prep myself to know what's what's gonna come back everybody there's gonna be a law if you stop marketing you're gonna feel it whether it's a year two years three years you're gonna feel it regardless hmm. fantastic well Amanda, thank you so much for for joining me and 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 actually becoming friends. I I uh, I, I do owe you a good dinner. Uh, this has been uh, just a wonderful. Uh, Thanks, John, for connecting us. Yes, thank you, John. He's our hookup. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Maybe we'll yeah. Maybe I'll buy for both. Okay, we'll figure that out later. Uh, but the 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 point of this is uh, I I do want folks to have a chance to to find you online and to take advantage. Um, of the services that they can get in. Uh, SosaStone.com is a place to go. Agency access. And we didn't get into intricacies there, but honestly, it's a re- all of your web presences are really well laid out. And you can very quickly, if you're at home watching, um, give yourself some time to comb through and get acclimated to some of the things that are that are available. And, and, and really, I guess if there's a moral to the story, and, and there's probably nuance to this where I'm missing it, but the moral of the story that I'm hearing is, number one, uh, if you want, if you want to get in this game, or you want to make it in this game, or even if you're making it in this game, to have this long view. If you don't have the long view, get out of the game, uh, or, or and not in a negative sense, but just it probably doesn't make a, a ton of sense because you're, you're going to be discouraged at the end of it. And in either case, it, it's not really a reflection of of uh, your your identity or value. It's it's just a choice. It's a career and. Yeah. I just so appreciate your your very sober, very winsome invitation to do it right. And uh, we need more of that in our industry. So thank you again. Thank you, Dang. Thanks for giving back to the community. We appreciate it. All right. All right. So we'll see you guys next week. And thanks again, Amanda. And we'll talk to you guys soon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good luck.